And our next speaker in that regard is Murad Batal El Shishani, who is a Jordanian uh, currently located in London uh, and who is focused uh, on the structure of uh, Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. I might mention that uh, Murad has a book that will be forthcoming in Arabic, Geopolitik Al Qaeda. Murad? Thank you very much. <coughs> Uh, me and uh, Barack and Dan was discussing about to be in a panel before the lunch. And it's an essential question for me personally. Every time I take part in, an, in a conference, uh, I was wondering why I'm the first, why I'm the late. I have objections and reservations on that. And that reminds me of a, a Chechen joke. Two Chechen guys went to visit an Ingush cousin. And Ingush are well known in North Kyrgyz that they are high class and very etiquette observing uh, ethnic group. The Chechen guy telling his friend, please don't make noise while sipping tea. Don't click the spoon while you are moving the sugar. The other guy said, please, I don't tell them I don't like to drink tea at all. So I don't like to be in any position in this conference. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll start my presentation, actually it's a slideshow, uh, about the Al-Qaeda in uh, Yemen. Uh, which uh, will, uh, will highlight the post-revolution strategies that they are implementing uh, uh, since the uh, youth-led revolutionary movement started in Yemen, which played major role in marginalizing Al-Qaeda and their presence in, or their rhetoric at least, in Yemen, which was very significant, as we've seen in all other Arab countries, while the Arab Spring is sweeping everywhere. But the government response, which uh, increased, escalated the tension inside the society, inside different, the different uh, uh, geographical spaces, played major role in, in re-emerging Al-Qaeda again. And here I mean Al-Qaeda and Arabian Peninsula, but I will use Al-Qaeda to refer it from now on. Since then, that we've noticed that Al-Qaeda, when they have seen, have marginalized with all these youth-led movements in, in the Arab world, or specifically in Yemen, uh, the, the tense were increased by the response of the government with the violence. They started re-emerging different areas. And uh, I will start with, with apology because the resolution is not high for this uh, um, uh, map, but it shows at least the expansion of Al-Qaeda after the revolution in Yemen. We've seen that traditionally, if you like, they, they, they existed or presence in Ibn Ma'rib and Shabwa, usually before the revolution. But since the revolution erupted, we've seen that there's, they are expanding to Hadamut and Adam, as you see in the, in the, um, uh, in, in the post-revolution color, which is blue. Uh, also, after post-revolution, we have seen an active cells in, um, in Salah, as well as in Jauf and Saba, but they couldn't create, establish a presence there because of the Shia-dominated areas, as, we, as, as Barak explained. So having this said, uh, Al-Qaeda, since they re-emerged recently, they started to implement a new strategies, how to can they uh, 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 infiltrate the Yemeni society and gain more presence on the ground. You can see, I, uh, this, I, will, I will let you listen to this or uh, see this video with the audio. This is from a uh, well-known ideologue of Al-Qaeda, Adil Abbad. He's talking about their positions uh, by, by, by creating the Ansab, uh, uh, Sharia small emirates in different areas of Al-Yemen, especially where they're expanding now. You will note that I, I have the translation on the uh, left hand, now you will see this will give you an idea what he is talking about, generally. We need the voice, sorry about that. I think this is not set to... I don't know the audio here to, to, to raise it up, but... Anyway, I will continue without the, the sound here. He's, he's usually more focusing on the terming, terming the, the uh, establishing the Sharia from elite uh, perspective into a popular movement, attracting locals, tribal, tribemen, all to them, solving their problems, and 
taking care of day-to-day -day, uh, issues, of their day-to-day -day issues. Hence, that will allow them to be more focusing on, the, on, on, on uh, establishing their own small sharia at that time. Is the Ansar Sharia. By that, they created the small faction of, they called them Ansar Sharia, small groups that basically are formed from the local tribesmen in the areas they are, um, <coughs> where they are expanding Al Qaeda. Uh, by this, creating this small uh, Ansar Sharia group, they focusing mainly on solving day to day problems. Also, they form this from the local tribesmen, which to avoid any revenge, just in case, which is which is which is a main problem you can see in, in Yemen with um, or any tribal society. So by this, they create they, they was uh, upper hand by this resilience by gaining support on the ground. The absence of the state, which play also a major role that the creating of, of Al Qaeda presence, as well as as I said, to avoid revenge and to avoid any problems with the locals. So this shows that Al-Qaeda has changed their own strategy from confrontation with the local, uh, so locals, especially the tribesmen, and we've noticed they have committed suicide bombers against two tribe leaders uh, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, from them, they, they, they were very successful in creating the small Sharia Imarats in, in different places. But this, this uh, the, the, the um, element of, of resilience that not limited to any women. We've seen that all literature of Al-Qaeda in Yemen are focusing on Yemen as a launching pad against Gulf states, specifically in Saudi Arabia. By focusing on Saudi Arabia, they are unable in this, at, the moment, at this moment to launch an open confrontation campaign as they did in between 2003 and 2007. So instead they resort to either recruiting the cells inside Saudi Arabia's cells or trying to smuggle them into Saudi territories to uh, commit uh, small attacks such as assassination as we've as we seen uh, last August, there was an attempt to attack the Prince Naif's palace, who was into a ministry. It comes at the second anniversary when the attempt on suicide attempt against his son, Mohammed bin Naif, as well. Having this said, uh, this regional, regional um, uh, a strategy has played major role in changing also the rhetoric of Al Qaeda, as we see in Ibrahim al Rubesh, his well known ideologue of Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. He has listed the seven demands to Saudi Arabia to stop fighting against them. Two are very historic and well known it's the expel of the infidels from the Arabian Peninsula, the second one is the rule of Al Sharia. But the other five are very, very interesting that uh, he focused on the judge independence of the judiciary system, a grant presidency for the Hayat al-Amr bil-Ma'ruf and Nahi al-Munkar, which is known in the West as a religious police, as well as the um, freedom of speech for the Islamic scholars, and this is a new specifically we are speaking about what they call Islamic scholars, release all prisoners, and also allow all the youngsters to defend themselves, uh, defend all Muslim lands. That means, you know, the Arab volunteering movement flow, which we've seen in previous times in Afghanistan or in Chechnya and other places to be um, uh, accepted by the government, which I've seen it's a new development in, in, in the understanding of the Al-Qaeda, which using this soft rhetoric or political rhetoric to attract more, um, um, more what we call it, uh, more recruits, and as well as to become and uh, uh, to show themselves as an integral part of the uh, uh, of the Arab Spring and the Earth movements. Uh, but at the at, at the end, I will I will move to the conclusions. Unfortunately, videos doesn't work here. It was very small clips. I wanted to share it with you, but it's available at any 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 time. Uh, Al Qaeda and Arabian Peninsula demonstrating a strong ability to adapt with generally Salafi jihadists to adapt with any pressure. We have seen. Uh, Al-Qaeda changing their strategies since 2001, since 9-11 attacks. Every time and then under the pressure they can adopt new strategies, and I've seen here in Yemen they are adopting new strategies as well uh, to, to, to avoid that. But what this new that the pressure put 
on Al Qaeda by the Arab Spring, by the youth movements, was stronger than the international community of so called war on terror in the previous 11 years. Having this said, Al Qaeda changing their positions. I'll give other examples. For in Jordan, for instance, for the first time we have seen Salafi jihadists going to protests on the streets demanding for. Uh, so the different demands for release prisoners and etc. We have seen now some voices in Al Qaeda, as I see in, in Arabian Peninsula, now presenting a new political rhetoric, which means that they are uh, uh, unable to to uh, or they are trying to adopt with the pressure which 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 uh, um, putting a huge pressure on them. But at the same time. The response, the violent response is playing major role, as we've seen in, in Yemen, for instance, while they're marginalized suddenly because of the violence of, at, um, committed by the government response, they re-emerged again. Having this said, I believe that just the violent response against the youth democratic civil movements in the Arab world can resort to Al-Qaeda again in Yemen and other places. Thank you very much. All right, does yeah. the AQAP agree they're losing? Uh, simply, I will say no. And uh, they, they are not losing, and also the United States are not winning the battle against IQIP and Al-Qaeda in general. Regarding U.S. interest, and I've written several times about that, U.S. US security, U.S. interest is not limited to their borders here. I think U.S. has interest is everywhere, in the Middle East and in South Asia and in North America. So that it's, it's a border definition for the security, um, uh, United States security and United States, uh, um, uh, what we call it, uh, interests. Having this said, I will say, yeah, I agree with the Jack. Our Al Alape's death is uh, uh, will not eliminate his effect, his impact on the messages he's sending. They are available on the internet. But moreover, more interesting and more important to me, Al Alape in the hierarchy of Al Qaeda, IQIP, is not influential. He is just a marginal. He is a PR guy there or he was a PR guy. Having this said, the most important figures are still there in Al-Qaeda. And I can start to count them, but still there. Having this said, we'll move to the drone attacks. I've read the uh, Joby Warwick's account on the triple agent. He's describing this very perfectly and magnificently, uh, how the drone attacks targeting with a stream back to Langley or Washington here. Having this said also, one of the major, there are many reasons for, for drones to be successful, but one of the major important that Al-Qaeda has switched their strategy from relying on, on, on individuals in different areas uh, to seek a safe, safe havens. Safe havens make drones work easier. So Al-Qaeda can sit back and change, switch their strategies easily. So I don't think it will be major. Third thing, and it's it's uh, uh, personally, I was speaking to Michael today. Uh, personally, I'm against killing as a principle in in targeting anywhere. But the conditions on the ground, which play major role in the emergence of Al Qaeda and other armed groups, are still exist there, and nobody touching it. And I agree with it, Dan. Yeah, we need to find other ways. Uh, Anwar Aulaka in 2001 or two, sorry, was interviewed by Washington Post and presented as the moderate Muslim and telling us about Ramadan and how we fast and we how we, need, we should love each other at that time. Um, uh, also, you mentioned and I agree with that how Al Qaeda promote themselves from Imam. It's easy. Salah Al Qarawi is, is is very influential of uh, Kitab Abdullah Azam now. He's uh, he, uh, nobody knows where his where about, but supposedly he is in in Levant area somewhere. He's a normal Saudi teenager in 2001. In 2003, he started to uh, attend these religious lectures. In 2006. He was uh, a deputy of Abu Musab al-Zarqawi before he was killed. So it's a promotion in three years' time. I think I bet I'm working for 15 years without no promotion. <laughs> 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 See? So, so this is the issue. We need to touch the areas. Also, we need to understand the grassroots, how it's going on the underground. How, how the, the Yemenis, uh, uh, last year we were here, and uh, me and Glenn was talking in his office when we left. 
Uh, I said there's, I've noticed since the, the occupation or invasion of Iraq, there's a taboo in the United States to talk about the political issue in the Middle East. Nobody tackling this issue, but the youngsters now in Egypt, Tunisia, everywhere they are, they're tackling it. They force us to speak about this. It's a major issue. Corruption, environment, poverty, all these issues are uh, a major rule. We, know, we, don't, we, we, we should stop sticking that, saying Ayman Zawahri and Osama bin Laden came from rich backgrounds. Others are not. That's my opinion on that. Thank you.